Welcome back to our next episode of Nuggets on the Go. Today, we are going to talk about supply. Singapore is modestly increasing its private housing land supply in the first half of next year. What is happening in the supply situation in specification to the landed market as well as the bedroom types of condos and apartments? It's part of the government's approach to tackle the root cause of the current housing problem and that's by increasing the supply of new flats rather than simply reducing prices. We're going to dive deep into some latest charts that our PLB research team has formulated just last week. Let's hit it. So we just completed our landed webinar uh, at the tail end of March and uh, thank you for those who have participated in the webinar. We've seen a lot of attendance because on that particular day there were concurrently about 480 of you that stayed throughout the entire one hour landed webinar and uh, we had a lot of questions, we had fun, we did a lot of uh, Q&A as well, as well as some quiz time during the webinar so thank you for participating. Of course a quick shout out is that if you want to sign up for more webinars we still have another 17 rounds of webinars to come. Click on this uh, link right below our in our description box. That will bring you to our propertyinvestors.com webinar page. There's also a QR code right here that you can scan. Feel free to join our webinars because our webinars are free. And uh, most importantly is that the start of our webinars has no product push because it's mainly on knowledge sharing as well as opinion sharing. Now, today we want to dive deep into this particular topic that I have talked a little bit during the Orlando webinar, but I'm going to dive deep into some brand new charts. Let me just show you what are some of the brand new charts that we're showcasing here because these are fresh out of the oven from our PLB research team. We have broken down basically all the condos and apartments that were created in the last 23 years and we segregated them into the bedroom types and we did a third segregation into freehold as well as 99 years. So we grouped them according to Tano, freehold triple nines, we grouped them as one in the uh, red color zoning. And of course the blue bars that you're seeing are 99 properties. And then we segregate them uh, in two segments. The, in terms of creation year on, of all these projects from 2000 to 2013, 2014 to 2022. We also further broke down the landed properties from the last 22 years in terms of 99 years and freehold as well and also the size of all these landed properties. And uh, later we're going to deep dive what does this mean for you um, as well as segregating them into OCR, CCR and RCR region and then we'll dive into summarize this entire episode of why understanding this a little bit more macro kind of um, factors does it affect your decision making whether you're hunting for a condo or a landed apartment in this current season of course if you have not seen our previous banter episode we talk and dive deep into the recent bank uh, issues that's happening in the US as well as uh, in Switzerland. We talk about Credit Suisse, we talk about SVB Bank, we talk about uh, the banking crisis that's facing right now and uh, how does that relate to our Singapore property market. So if you want to understand a little bit more, head on to the banter episodes and uh, I think you're going to enjoy the banter session that we had. Now coming here, landed property is a very different property. So a quick understanding about landed homes is that landed as a property, whether you are buying for your stay or as an investment, it falls under this quadrant one category. Now quadrant one category belongs to properties as a form of asset that are high growth but low rental yield. That is of course uh, pulling out from a helicopter view looking at residential properties as a whole. Of course if you were to ask me which kind of properties has the best rental yield, I would say that it is HDB apartments. Why? Because the entry price of a HDB apartment is low and of course for those of you who have owned uh, two properties if uh, you might be holding one HDB and you are holding one private property and of course some of you might be puzzled hey how do you achieve that because on the ground you might have thought that hey it is impossible to own a HDB and a private property at the same time but yes it is possible there are various ways of doing it but in summary the way to own a HDB and a private property is by two ways number one is that you have to start from the HDB route first own a HDB, hold it for five years, fulfill the minimum occupation period, and then you can buy a second property, which is a private property. Uh, of course, you can, nobody can own two HDB. You can only own one as a couple. And uh, even if you're a single person, 
if you own a HDB resale property uh, when you bought it at age 35, at 40 years old, you can pay ABSD and buy a second property, which is a private home. And then you can move to your private property, you can rent out a HDB. Now, there's also a second way to do it is of course using the owner occupier method. Own the HDB from uh, the start, hold it for five years. And of course the occupier can come out to buy a private property. Of course, that's subjected to in the event if any HDB rulings change, uh, you have to take note that of course this method is subjected to future HDB changes and uh, the sole discretion belongs to HDB as well. Now, coming back to this four quadrants, HDB property belongs to, maybe make a guess which quadrant, and I'll uh, give you probably five seconds to just make a guess which quadrant does HDB property belongs to, which quadrant does lender homes belongs to, and then which quadrant does small condo and apartments belongs to. So you're right, if you have guessed Q3, that is correct. HDB properties falls under the category of Q3, quadrant three. So it belongs to low growth, but high rental you. Now, I'm not talking about the fact that you have waited five to six years for BTO. Now, if you have bought a BTO, congratulations, because BTO so far, it has performed very well from the date of purchase until the MOP date when you want to exit. MOP date or maybe later, it definitely will have appreciated from your entry price as a BTO until your MOP day. Of course, you might have waited four to five years for your construction, and you need to stay another five years for MOP. All in all, you're waited for about maybe nine years or 10 years. It will definitely be much higher when you exit compared to your entry price as build. I'm talking about the fact that if you were to have purchased a resale HDB, five years of MOP uh, period later, in terms of growth rate, it is not as fast as private properties or landed homes. So why are HDB apartments belonging to Q3 is because the overall quantum entry price is low. So for example, if you bought a HDB apartment at 500,000, six or seven or 800,000, but the amount of rental that you collect every month, if you multiply by 12, and we talk, we're talking about gross rental yield, of course there's various calculation to calculate net rental yield because you have to shave off um, your agency fees, your property tax, your maintenance fee and all that kind of stuff. But Gross rental you is considered as a very high, usually four to six or even seven or eight percent in terms of rental you. Now, when we look at small apartments, some of the small apartments fall under quadrant three, some of course fall under quadrant four. But generally speaking, when we talk about landed homes, they fall under quadrant one because they are high growth and the entry quantum is high. For example, to get an inter-terrace minimally for a cat one inter-terrace that is meant for rebuild, you're going in at about 3.6 to $4 million for OCR landed home. But the rental you definitely in conjunction, if you divide by the overall entry price is going to be lower than a condominium. So condominiums, of course, they either fall under Q1, Q3, Q2, or Q4. And I would say that condominiums fall under all spectrum, depending on in particular, what kind of projects, what bedroom types, which area, which region are you buying into? But that is not for today's topic. Today's topic, we want to first understand a little bit about the supply factor. And because of the fact that land as an investment is high growth, low rental you. But the question is that why are people still buying land at home? Now, the reason is because if you look at the relationship between supply as well as price, I shared this during our webinar is that Landed homes in Singapore has the most inelastic price versus supply relationship. What do I mean by that? When we talk about economics, price, supply, and when we talk about demand supply, there are price inelasticity, price elasticity, demand elasticity, demand inelasticity. But in this situation, we are relating to the fact that when a price of a product or asset increases, the supply increases. Let me give you an example from top to maybe a, a micro factor. When the price of properties grow in Singapore, an example, let's talk about private condos and apartments. When the prices surge too fast, what is going to happen is that that's going to attract government attention to release more land. They will release more GLS because they want to satisfy the demand from buyers as well as developers. And they want to make sure that there is no extreme escalation in terms of price or they do not want a bubble to be formed. So naturally, when the price of condos and apartments rises too fast, government will take action to release more land. Have a look at HGB apartments as well. So let's come out one scale. Recently, of course, there's a lot of parliamentary talk about the cost of BTOs, the cost of HGB apartments. And guess what happens? The recent announcement is that our government is going to construct and build 
close to 150 BTO projects by year 2026. That is an example of the relationship between price and supply. When price rises, supply comes in to fill up the demand so that price don't rise too fast. And that's just an example of condos and HDB. Now, let's come to another factor. Take a look at gold. When gold was being announced in the past, um, there was this era called the gold standard. Gold predominantly before 1971, before the gold standard was eradicated, before US currency became the no dominant global currency in the world, every country and every federal reserve and every central bank will keep gold at their vault as base currency. So everybody's currency is based on the amount of gold that you have in your central bank. But after 1971, gold standard was removed. US dollars caused the shot. That becomes the global currency. That is a whole new topic about how it escalated to today's money supply issue that we have too much money supply. Our inflation is rising so high. I mean, just have a look at the latest inflation figures uh, in Singapore. It's at 5.5 to 6%. That is just a CPI inflation figure in the basket of goods. But let me just give you an example. From 1971 till date, inflation and asset inflation has been the major dominant issue. And uh, how, do you, how do you relate this? Just take an example of the price of a vehicle three years ago in the year 2020, your $300,000 in the past could have bought you maybe a luxury car. But your $300,000 today could only probably just buy you half a luxury car. That is just an example of inflation. Of course, we have COE and all that kind of stuff. But it's just an example of how inflation reduces the real value of your money. Though your nominal value, your $300,000 is the same, but your real value of $300,000 technically is being inflated by the increase in money supply. In the past, when gold was the gold standard, a lot of gold miners flood in to create more gold, to dig more gold, to hunt for more gold because they want to be part of this game and system in order to enjoy the price appreciation. But when we look at landed homes again, today's context, let's just have a look. Landed homes are at this current graph. It has not increased since 1995 in terms of the overall landed supply. The supply has sort of plateaued, especially since 2011 until today. That is about 12 years already of plateau. And there's no more government land sales on new land. In fact, the latest one that I've seen was this project at uh, Haogang. Um, that is Parkwood Collection. I think it's fully sold already. Cluster, strata home, beautiful homes. 99 years released by government, but that was for a cluster strata concept. That is as good as you get. You don't get large plot of GRS land for freehold triple nine years, pure landed homes. And I'm talking about pure landed properties that are freehold triple nine years. You don't get that increment in supply anymore. And that's the reason why landed homes in Singapore has the most restricted amount of supply. And when price goes up, price has an inelastic relationship to the supply. Supply cannot go up. And because of this, this asset class is very different. It behaves differently. And when it behaves differently, it became a very, very valuable asset in the sense that if you were to hold a landed home, you are more or less assured that in terms of an asset value, it's going to appreciate stronger, better, and faster through time compared to the other two asset type, which is, of course, condominiums and HDB apartments. So we are talking about capital allocation to the type of property and uh, specifically residential properties and what kind should you put your capital in. And this is also an illustration of weaker money going into stronger money. So in economics as well, the weak money will flow, always flow towards the strong money. Similarly, people who have capital in weaker assets, they want to divest and switch it to a stronger asset, which is why you see that pull and push from HGB apartments, people want to upgrade to a private property and then they want to upgrade to a landed property. It's because they naturally identify in terms of price upwards growth and valuation growth. They will naturally know as a consumer, as a buyer, as a property investor, you will naturally figure out once you are in the property scene that, hey, why is it that condominiums appreciate faster than my HGB apartment? And once you own a condominium, you realize that, hey, why is it that the landed property appreciates much faster than my condominium? So this relationship shows in terms of the results on the ground. And that is the reason uh, why we say that in terms of price and supply, that forms 
the relationship of price appreciation as well. So this forms the rationale on why landed homes appreciates much faster in terms of time span and ROI in terms of valuation appreciation. Now, so we talk about in some of our banter episodes, if you're following us, I think that was in session one or two, we talk about um, the type of new launches that has been created before 2013 and after 2013. That was because of TDSR measure, developers started building smaller and smaller apartments. But let's have a look at landed homes. So as you can see, there's a very high focus on semi-Ds as well as corner terraces. And that is of course, populated by this bar right here. Uh, we purposefully segregated this in a few key segments. Number one, 1614 square feet is the entry subdivision requirement for an inter-terrace. So inter-terrace minimally has to be 150 square meters after subdivision. So we categorize it here. 2152 square feet after subdivision, meaning that if any developers or even yourself, you to buy a big plot of land and if it qualifies for subdivision for you to cut it out into two semi-Ds or maybe cut it out into... Um, one inter-terrace and two corner terraces. The minimum is for a semi-D to have at least 2152 square feet. So we categorize it here. The minimum for a detached to be subdivided into a detached is 400 square meters. So we categorize it as 4306 square feet. So based on this, basically you can see that there's a very high creation volume in terms of semi-Ds, as well as of course, uh, some corner terraces will also fall into this range. What we want to see here is this. The entry level into a landed property market are inter-terraces. So entry level, meaning that people usually, when they want to get into a, the landed market, and if let's say they have a first wave uh, of requirements that, firstly, I want to own a landed property, but I can only afford something in the range of maybe four to maybe about five odd million, then they will have to kickstart from the inter-terrace range. And if let's say they come in with about five plus to six, they can kickstart from the semi-D range in the OCR region. And we're talking largely about the OCR region, like D19, D28, some uh, key areas, maybe like Springfield or D13, you might be able to get some of these properties. But uh, what we're trying to say is that if you look at this, in terms of population, Overall, the semi Ds and the corner terraces, they own a large chunk of supply. But I know that it doesn't matter because uh, we're now talking about micro already because in totality, there are only 73,000 landed homes. Three and a half million Singaporeans can qualify to buy that. If there were to be just 10% of Singaporeans that want to buy a landed home, you're looking at 350,000 Singaporeans that can qualify to buy 73,000 landed homes. And take note that when we talk about landed properties, there are various groups of people. Firstly, foreigners who qualify under SLA approval, if let's say um, SLA deems them under the uh, LDAU uh, policy that they uh, contribute economically to Singapore, they allow them to buy landed home, they fall under the first spectrum. Number two, existing landed home owners, most of the time they do not sell their homes. They pass on to their children for legacy. They tear down and rebuild they might buy more landed homes under their children's name. And most of the landed owners, because they have enjoyed appreciation over the years, and they enjoy such a big space over the last 10, 20, 30 years, they do not sell their landed homes and they keep it. And then they restructure their portfolio in the sense that they might buy a bigger landed home or they might downsize to a smaller landed home. But most of the time, what we notice is that when a when an existing owner is already in the landed market, they tend to stay in the landed market for a very long duration. Number three, you have condominium buyers that aspire to buy landed homes. Number four, sometimes we see HDB apartment upgraders going straight into the landed scene. And of course, when you look at that, and then you look back at this supply, you will then also start to realize that in terms of the inelasticity between price and supply, this gets even more true. When we come to a micro level, so we have this chart, which is the total amount of landed in each district as well as the entire island. So, we have a total figure of 73,000 here. Let me zoom in for you. This is after we have compiled District 2 all the way to District 28. The number of detached homes falls in the range of 10,000 homes. Semi-D homes, 22,000. Terrace house, 40,000. Now, terrace homes, we're talking about intermediate as well as corner terraces. And though you see that there are 40,000 homes, but these are the most sought after in terms of demand because of the palatable range. And the moment that you want to move into semi-D, you realize that semi-D has only about 22,000. Now, of course, the final one, which is the most um, high quantum range will be 10,000 units. So if you break it down like this, you realize that actually 
there are not a lot of choices in the market. And that's the key reason why wherever you look at the landed market, sometimes you're out of choice. And sometimes you realize that it's not easy to buy a home in the market because a lot of times people that already own landed homes, they have no motivation to sell unless they want to move bigger. They want to switch to a different district. And this probably would that help you a little bit in terms of ascertaining, in terms of supply and price relationship as well as supply and demand relationship because landed property is already a class of its own. We talk about this in a lot of our Nuggets on the Go episodes before. And importantly, when you want to get into the landed market, it's also very important to understand this concept is that landed properties are high quantum properties. So when you want to exit five, eight, ten years later, it is actually an art and a science to ensure that when you buy something at this point in time, you have to know that this is a high quantum property, is a high quantum asset. Though for the very fact that there is demand and there's very limited supply, but because it is high quantum, you definitely need more time to find the next buyer. And the higher the quantum of your landed home goes, the more time it is to find a buyer. Because if you hold an inter-terrace that is valued at, let's say, five and a half million now, compared to holding a detached home that is $9 million. Your potential audience that is going to buy a detached home has a nine to maybe $11 million budget. Compared to your buyer that's going to buy your inter-terrace has a five to $6 million budget. It is much easier to find a buyer with an inter-terrace budget compared to a buyer with a detached home budget. The reason is because firstly, nine to 11 million, the audience size will shrink there is a bigger audience size for a five to six million dollar budget. Secondly, the person with a nine to 11 million dollar budget, there's going to be more choices for them because they can hunt around for either a semi-D or a detached home at different districts. They can either go for an extremely huge detached at the OCR region, or they can go for a smaller detached or a smaller semi-D in the CCR region. So when you are talking about landed entry right now, it's also very important to note that because of this, few key parameters and, and this two, basically I'm talking about this two in terms of quantum and exit, in terms of specific requirements. There are 21 factors right here in our PLB lender mode analysis that helps our clients determine what are the right type of properties in terms of the landed market to enter into based on the current quantum investment range that they have. So for example, when we meet a client that has about, maybe somebody that has six to $8 million range, we use this concept called the disparity effect as well as seasons of change to help our clients determine using the 21 factors right here, seven factors in terms of our increasing buyer audience strategy as well as increasing price acceptability strategy. And then seven factors on reducing unexpected outcome. So basically based on this, we help our clients to determine on totality using our journey maker. And we shared this a little bit during our PLB landed webinar is that this journey maker, basically we have been using it to help our clients ascertain what are the right types of landed homes to go for in a particular district that they prefer. So for example, if somebody were to come to us and they have five to six million dollars range and they really want to buy something in D28 because of maybe school needs or they want to live near their current family enclave, then we use the concept of disparity effect, seasons of change, as well as the mode analysis to determine what are the exact type in terms of cat one, cat two, cat three, and cat four homes that they should go for. And in terms of disparity as well, let me just give you a quick glimpse right here. In terms of disparity, in terms of the type of homes that they should hunt for, and we call this the disparity effect across the different cat regions. So if you want to understand this deeper, do sign up for our landed webinar. We still have about two to three rounds of landed webinars that's upcoming throughout the entire 2023. We're going to leave the links as well as the QR codes right here. And of course, we have a landed convention upcoming as well in the mid of this year. Do sign up for the landed convention because the landed convention is going to feature brand new landed homes as well as some of the resale landed properties that's available in the market. It's going to be a six to seven hours event. More details will be revealed in this link as well. And thank you for staying tuned with us on this particular Nuggets on Go episode. We hope to see you on the next one. And I think the next episode is going to be a banter series. We'll see you on the next banter episode. In the meantime, take care. <laughs> There's a bird in the studio. Oh, yeah. My cardigan is making me very hot. <laughs>